Meyer Lansky was sitting pretty. The National Crime Syndicate had just been formed. He had friends in powerful places all around the country and a successful business in the legal alcohol trade. But this was just the beginning for Lansky. His empire was about to take shape. If you're interested in learning about how Lansky got to this point, make sure to check out our part one video. When the prohibition was abolished in 1932, Lansky knew that he would need to find a new venture to capitalize on. One business he had experience with was gambling, and he figured this was going to be the next big thing for all the crime lords around the country. Lansky didn't want to be front and center of this effort. He preferred to stay behind the scenes and finance most of these operations, which started to become big money in the mid-1930s. One such venture was the development of New Orleans. Huey Long, the Kingfish, governor of Louisiana, was visiting Hotel New Yorker, and Lansky tipped off one of his associates, Frank Costello, that he would be there. Costello approached the Kingfish about setting up some slot machines, and courted him throughout his stay in New York. Once they safely had the deal underway, Lansky worked out the final financial details at the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans. Long would get $20,000 a month of the venture, but he wasn't really aware of the profits that the slots would bring in. A much more sizable portion went to Lansky, Costello, and a few other NCS members. Eventually, Long's involvement with the NCS got the better of him, and he grabbed the attention of federal agents, who decided to indict him. Naturally, he couldn't be left alive. He was shot down in Baton Rouge. Another such venture was in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where Lansky and Costello financed the creation of a few gambling joints to take advantage of the elderly population that lived there. The mini gambling center endured for decades, even through the Depression and the war, and raked in some serious dough for Lansky and his allies. But no development was nearer and dearer to Lansky than that of the Hotel Nacional in Havana, Cuba. He had visited the country a few times in the past and had become friends with Fulgencio Batista, who had come to power after he led the 1933 revolt of the sergeants. At the time, the Depression limited the success of the gambling empire in Cuba, but Lansky was patient. He knew the Depression couldn't last forever, and he bided his time until Havana would become an international gambling paradise. As the influence of the NCS grew to be nationwide, the government began to take notice. They were aware of several key members of the NCS, but it was easier to just go after the Mafia, as they were an enemy that the public understood. Ambitious prosecutor Thomas Dewey was one such politician who understood that in order to get public approval, he had to bring down some big names. He wanted to be district attorney, and then governor of New York. He set his sights on the then boss of all bosses of the Mafia, Lucky Luciano. It didn't take much to bring Lucky down. There was ample evidence that Lucky had helped several prostitution rings in the city, and the jury offered a quick conviction. Lucky was sentenced to 30 to 50 years for his part in the operation. But Lucky had no intention of serving the time fully. Lansky had made him a promise. He would exercise his power and influence to get Lucky out of jail as soon as possible. This was quite a gamble on Lansky's part. If he failed, he would face the ire of the entire mafia. If he succeeded, he would gain massive prestige and increase his influence in the NCS. But Lansky, ever the gambling man, didn't balk at the risk. He embraced it. He didn't exactly have a plan yet, but he knew that something would come up. He could always grease the wheels of a politician. He wasn't worried. Such an opportunity presented itself when Thomas Dewey accepted the nomination for governor of New York. His years of busting the mafia had paid off. Lansky knew that even though Dewey had been the one to convict Luciano, he could still be put under obligation. Supposedly, Lansky pumped nearly $250,000 into Dewey's campaign. A master of secrecy, Lansky used respectable fronts for injecting his money into the campaign. Unfortunately for Lansky, Dewey narrowly lost the election which was a fairly considerable setback in his plans. However, in 1942, nearly six years after Lucky was sentenced, Dewey secured the governor's seat. In the 1940s, the fight against local mobsters subsided considerably as the focus for the entire world became World War II. To Lansky, the play to get Luciano out of prison was obvious. If he could only figure out a way for Lucky to help the war effort, he could easily secure his release. This was the beginning of Operation Underworld, an effort by naval intelligence to gather counterintelligence about Italy by using known Italian Mafia members in the US. Lansky was critical to recruiting Luciano. 
After naval intelligence failed to get the information they were looking for from other Mafia members, they approached a lawyer named Moses Polakoff, who had represented Lucky during his trial, and Lansky since the Prohibition days. Polakoff introduced Lansky to the appropriate people at naval intelligence, and eventually a deal was struck. Lansky would help get Lucky to cooperate with Operation Underworld. In exchange, they would consider shortening Lucky's sentence in accordance with the amount that he helped the effort. Lucky agreed. Thus, Lansky became the spokesperson between Lucky and the rest of the Mafia. If Lucky requested information, or required a Mafia member to attend a session with the investigators, Lansky would be the one to give the word. Because it was known that Lansky was helping to free the boss, most Mafia members followed his word without question. Not much is known about how much Lucky truly helped the project, but there have certainly been many tall tales around the subject, including one that he personally led the invasion. Regardless of his actual contribution, eventually he commissioned Governor Dewey for release, which was granted. Lucky was released from prison. Lansky had upheld his promise and looked like a hero to the Mafia. But that didn't stop Lucky from being deported back to Italy upon his release. A quick plan was made for Lucky to request an Italian passport and settle back in Cuba, where he would operate the Mafia once again as the boss of all bosses. After the end of World War II, a new era of excess began. The post-war boom brought with it new roads, new cars, and airplanes that could carry people all around the world. Lansky had positioned himself beautifully with the gambling operations all around the country and in Cuba. Finally, the preparation was starting to pay off, and those operations which had previously just been scraping by suddenly became massively profitable. But that didn't stop Lansky and his associates from setting up shop and even more gambling operations around the country. Now, all eyes turned to Nevada, where legal gambling made it a haven for the mob. By setting up a few legal gambling enterprises, they could use the casinos there to rake in even more dough, or even launder some money that they made in other places around the country. But that wasn't enough for Lansky. He had so much dough coming in that he had to find other ways to launder it. He opened up bank accounts in Switzerland, whose finance experts didn't care where the money came from. The Swiss had a long history of keeping secrets. Later on, in 1957, Lansky would open the Hotel Riviera in Havana, the largest casino in the Caribbean. The exotic hotel boasted vacationers with impressive acts and lavish food, and it proved to be one of Lansky's most successful ventures of all. It made over $3 million in its first four months of operation alone. In 1945, Bugsy approached Lansky with a brilliant idea. He wanted to build a state-of-the-art casino a few miles away from the others that existed in Vegas. This plush, exotic casino was going to be called the Flamingo, and Bugsy was hot about it. The Flamingo would become one of the first casinos in what is now the Las Vegas Strip. Lansky approached other members of the NCS, and he put together enough funding, nearly $1 million, for Bugsy to pursue his dream, and Bugsy went to work. But the project was bumpy from the start. Incredibly ambitious, Bugsy seemed to have no regard for the amount of money that he spent on the project. And soon the resources of the NCS were strained as the project started costing more and more. Lansky was starting to get some heat from his associates. Bugsy also started to get territorial about Las Vegas, which was a cardinal sin in the new era of the NCS, where territory lines were strictly monitored and controlled. Lansky realized that he had a major problem. Bugsy had gone off the rails. When the casino finally opened, the profits didn't follow. Based eight miles from the other casinos, the joint failed to draw enough crowds to make it profitable, and Lansky's concern grew. Bugsy requested more money to build a hotel to draw even more people. When the losses on his venture reached nearly $500,000, Bugsy decided to close down the casino until the hotel could be completed. Eventually, things turned around for Bugsy and the Flamingo, but the growth was slow. He cleared nearly $300,000 in one month, but that was chicken feed compared to what the profits eventually would be. Bugsy started to get greedy. Word was that he was planning to split town with nearly $600,000 of the profits to join his girlfriend, Virginia Hill, in Paris. Members of the NCS were furious. A meeting of the NCS was held, and most members of the NCS wanted Bugsy dead. Lansky begged them to give his friend one more chance, and they relented. Lansky flew to Vegas to meet with Bugsy, but the meeting didn't end well. Lansky eventually confided in another mob member, Jimmy Blue Eyes, about the exchange. 
Bugsy had decided to stay, but insisted that Vegas was his. The syndicate, he said. Lansky. Lansky ordered the hit on his oldest friend. Bugsy was shot down in LA by a syndicate killer with a 30 caliber carbine. He was shot twice in the head. Bugsy was the first syndicate chairman to be sentenced to death, but he wouldn't be the last. For Lansky, being a part of the mob was a game more than anything else. He didn't lust for riches or power in the same way that others did. Instead, he enjoyed the game of capitalizing on others' failures and climbing his way up to the top through the exercise of influence. The members of the NCS were merely pieces in the game of chess that Lansky was playing. Sometimes, pieces had to be sacrificed. Enemy pieces had to be taken out strategically and mercilessly. Lansky would eventually take out many of the top members of the NCS through various means. One of his betrayals would be none other than his longtime friend and associate, Lucky Luciano. After Lucky had posted up in Cuba and set himself up to operate as the boss of all bosses from there, Lansky saw his influence waning. The degree of control that he had had in the Mafia when Lucky was in prison and Italy was a power that he didn't want to give up. So Lansky came up with a plan. Lansky sent an informer to have a chat with the Federal Narcotics Bureau in Havana about Lucky, who tipped the investigators off to Lucky's influence in Cuba. It wasn't long before Lucky was once again being deported back to Italy, but who was he leaving to act in his stead? None other than his closest confidant, Meyer Lansky. Lansky would go on to have key roles in getting several NCS members either pushed out of the organization or killed. None of the big players were safe. Through some intense moves of influence, Lansky managed to get Joe Adonis deported, Costello pushed out of the organization, and Albert Anastasia, a longtime rival, killed. After all was said and done, Lansky had built an empire. By making his associates rich, he had effectively stayed behind the scenes in the mob, financing operations, but having little stake in actually running the businesses. His investments had paid off. His net worth was reaching nearly $400 million. But unfortunately for Lansky, the government started to wise up to the racket. One by one, mob members started to get picked off for silly charges such as tax evasion, a common problem for those who launder money. And Lansky was no exception. In 1970, fearing the rap of the tax man, Lansky fled to Israel, hoping that Israel's law of return would allow him to become a naturalized citizen. But Israeli officials saw through Lansky and made a discretionary call to deny him due to his criminal past. After two years in the country, Lansky was deported back to the US, where he faced being prosecuted for tax evasion. A glimmer of hope remained, as he was acquitted of all charges in 1974. But it seemed like Lansky had had enough of the hard life of organized crime. 72 years old at the time, the experience shook Lansky, and he decided to retire. He settled down in Miami, where he lived out the rest of his days. He died of lung cancer in 1983. On paper, he was worth almost nothing. But that's the beauty of crime. A person's wealth on paper is never the whole story. It's estimated that Lansky left nearly $300 million in secret bank accounts around the world. Thanks for watching part two, and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more.